Okay, so welcome to study this seminar. And today we are very delighted to have uh, our first speaker, Yang Jun Choi from Department of Industrial and System Engineering. Yang Jun got his PhD in Michi University of Michigan in, in, in Industrial Engineering and in 2016. And then he joined UW here. And he's, today he's going to talk a lot about very exciting work about information criteria for Boltzmann approximation problems. So Yang, your, time, your turn. All right, thank you very much, Yen Chi. Uh, it is my great pleasure to speak to you all uh, in this seminar. Uh, as as Yen Chi introduced, I'm an assistant professor in industry and systems engineering department here at UDAO. I want to make this seminar as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Then I believe Yen Chi or Christine will unmute so that you can speak up. So again, let's make it interactive as much as possible. And also, I'm curious how many of you are students or non-students. So I heard that most of, audience most of audience members are students. But if you are not students, please let me know by just uh, sending me a chat message so I can know whom I'm speaking to. All right. With that, uh, let me start. So this is about information criterion for Boltzmann approximation problems. So this is quite specific research work I've been doing with Yen Chi, uh, our host here, and also our PhD student in IESC department, Nick Terry. And this work is available, I mean, the preprint of this work is available at uh, this archive site, so you can check this out. And this work is supported by NSF grant. So we are very grateful for that. So before I talk about that specific research work, I want to first uh, introduce myself by talking about our research lab's work. So my, I run disaster data science lab here at UW, and you can check out our, our lab website. And spe specifically, I want to just highlight three works so you can see what kind of work I do, where I'm coming from. Essentially, I'm an engineer, industrial and systems engineer slash applied statistician. So my background is really applied from statistics per perspective, and I love working with uh, hardcore statisticians like Yen Chi, and it was really fun. And that kind of work is something I'm gonna present today. But just to give you a context of my background, here's one project I'm currently working on. So this is uh, about COVID-19. So since I run Disaster Data Science Lab, we use data science techniques, mainly applied stat uh, statistics techniques to extract important insights from various types of data. In this case, we are collecting street view, like Google street view, like images from, uh, from Seattle area, every almost two or three weeks since May 2020. So right after our uh, COVID-19 pandemic started. So main goal of this data collection was to see how people are responding and recovering from COVID-19. And basically we are using this kind of imagery data to say uh, count the vehicles that are going around and number of pedestrians and whether they are physically distancing or whether they are wearing face coverings or not and so on. So we are basically collecting this kind of imagery data and collecting various statistics uh, associated with various locations or demographics and then try to gain some insights about how we could potentially do better of our COVID-19 recovery. So that's one project I'm working on, uh, supported by NSF, gratefully. Another project I'm working on in our lab is essentially using expert knowledge and past disaster event data to predict the recovery times of various important critical infrastructures in the United States, such as electricity, water, gas, and so on. So basically, since we are using expert knowledge and past even data, as you can imagine, we are using Bayesian inference, inferential framework to properly quantify the uncertainties and appropriately, appropriately incorporate our expert knowledge and the data. So that's also supported by NSF, gratefully. And lastly, this is the topic I'm gonna talk about today. Another project I'm, uh, we are working on in our lab uh, in collaboration with Yen Chi is basically about accelerating stochastic computational experiments using various sources of data. Here, basically today, I'm going to talk about one line of work related to this particular project. 
also supported by our NSF gratefully. All right, here's an overview of the talk today. I'm gonna first briefly talk about the motivation of why we started this work, and there's some challenges associated with uh, this particular problem and remedy we came up with, and I'm gonna summarize the talk uh, in one slide later today. All right, let's start with some motivation about this particular research work. So computer simulation is widely, widely used in engineering, especially because many physical experiments are often expensive, difficult, or even impossible to conduct so that only computer simulations can be used, used to understand better about such systems in various engineering disciplines. For example, to understand the reliability of a nuclear reactor, we need to rely on a lot of computer simulations since nuclear experiments are simply banned uh, around the world, especially in the United States. And to study the reliability also for wind turbine at the design stage or aircraft, we do use a lot of computer simulations because physical experiments are really, really expensive. And also to prepare for various extreme events, especially extreme weather events or future disaster events, we do also use a lot of computer simulations because simply we cannot do any experiments about such disasters or large scale weather events. So computer simulations are widely used in engineering and it is very important to develop to case on develop statistical methods that can accelerate such important simulations that will give us important insights about how we can better design our systems. And crude Monte Carlo method is by far the most widely used method to do conduct such simulation experiments. So CMC or crude Monte Carlo or just standard Monte Carlo method is like this. Let's say we want to estimate some average behavior of a system of interest. That could be nuclear reactor or that could be, uh, that could be wind turbine uh, system. And that average behavior, let's say, is some expectation of some output variable or response variable Y. And that expectation, as you know, could be some probability of a certain event. And in particular, in reliability engineering context, we are interested in estimating the probability of failure event of such important systems or mission critical systems. So here's the setup. Sorry, here's the setup. Input uh, is basically from some probability distribution to capture or model some uncertainties in the inputs. That input could be, say, wind speed, and that's obviously stochastic. And uh, we are going to input such parameters into simulation model, and we'll run such simulation models. And oftentimes, these simulation models are computationally very expensive to run because they are high fidelity simulation model that very accurately mimic the actual systems. And based on simulation model, we will get the output and Y is the output. And that output is gonna be a function of input parameter and potentially some uh, epsilon or randomness injected within the simulation model to better mimic the real world system. So epsilon could be a randomness or if there's no, like epsilon is just deterministic, then this g is going to be determinist functions. So we call that kind of simulation model determinist, deterministic simulation model. But if epsilon is indeed random, then y is going to be stochastic even if you fix x. So if that's the case, then we call such simulation models uh, stochastic simulation models. So later today, I'm going to talk about a little bit different approaches to deterministic and stochastic simulation models. So that's why I wanted to emphasize the difference between deterministic and stochastic simulation models. And using crude Monte Carlo simulation, typically, again, we want to estimate some expectation or average behavior with the system. And again, input xi equals like this. And that goes, that's fed into computer model or simulation model. And that X is from some distribution. And that distribution F is assumed known. And that F is essentially, for example, based on data, we model real world um, phenomenon about how typical parameters behavior, for example, again, wind speed 
Um, and we can typically use some uh, rail, Rayleigh distribution or Raleigh distribution to model uh, mean speed in practice. So we have such a known distribution. And then given that, uh, we have x, and then we, got, we get y from simulation model. And let's say we repeated running such simulation model n times, considering various randomness in x and also potentially within the simulation model, then we can simply use this sample mean or sample average to estimate expectation of y. That's going to be crude Monte Carlo estimator. So that's very, very standard approach typically used in practice. And here, let's say we want to estimate failure probability of the system. Again, like uh, in our case study, later we will see evaluating the reliability of wind turbine. And in that case, we are particularly interested in estimating the failure probability, which is the probability that y, the output y, which actually um, re uh, represents structural response of wind turbine blade, will exceed L, some threshold. And if that structural load response exceeds L, then the system will fail. So that's why we want to estimate this probability. So that's the setup in reliability engineering. So here's output y, x, and we are basically interested in this kind of uh, these failure events and probability of that failure event. And we can use CMC to estimate that. But there are multiple challenges of using crude with Carlo in reality. Again, simulators are oftentimes computationally very expensive to run because many engineers put a lot of time to build really accurate simulation models that very well mimic actual systems. For example, in our wind turbine case study, we need to spend about one minute wall clock time to simulate 10 minute actual operation of wind turbine. And to evaluate the reliability of such highly reliable or mission critical system, then such reliability evaluation takes a lot of time. For example, to evaluate the 50 years worth of reliability of wind turbine design, then as you can see, we need to spend five years of world clock time, which is simply infeasible. You do not want to let your computer run this simulation for the next five years. So oftentimes high performance computing or supercomputers are used in reality to run such high fidelity simulation models. Even if that's the case, US national labs still need to run their supercomputers one week to get reliability, reliability evaluation of one wind turbine design. That is expensive. So, because such simulation models are expensive and reliability evaluation takes a lot of simulation replications, for example, if you are interested in event that could happen only once in 50 years, that means we need to repeat the simulation 2.6 million times, assuming that each replication represents 10 minute operation of wind turbine. And another issue with the reliability evaluation using stochastic simulation model or um, any simulation model involving randomness is potentially the high vari variability of such reliability estimation or, or estimation of failure probability. So as you can imagine, we can increase the sample size or the number of replications of a simulation model evaluation to reduce the, reduce the estimation variance but increasing number of replications again also means running simulation model even longer time. So that's going to be again, even more expensive. So to uh, address such computational issues, there are various techniques known as variance reduction techniques that are specifically designed to accelerate such stochastic computational experiments. An important sampling is one of those uh, variance reduction techniques that was proposed in 1953. It's old technique, but still very, very useful in, useful in practice. So here's the setup again. Uh, we are interested in the probability that Y output will exceed some threshold L. And originally we were sampling X from this original density F. But since we are particularly interested in the event that y will exceed l, 
we can imagine that we might want to focus our simulation, even a simulation in X, that will give us Y that are more likely, more likely to exceed L. So if we sample X from this new density, which is called the important sampling density, then we can now use important sampling estimator. So in this important sampling estimator, since we are changing the distribution of X from F to Q, we need to correct, um, we need to correct the bias in the original estimator. This uh, black part is CMC, crude multi color estimator. But we need to multiply this likely rate, likelihood ratio to correct the bias in this probability estimator. Then if by multiplying this likely ratio between F and Q, then this important sampling estimator will remain unbiased, assuming that the support of Q includes support of F. And it is theoretically known that the optimal important sampling density looks like this. So essentially uh, this term uh, times F divided by the probability but if you carefully look at this optimal important sampling density, you can see that first, uh, this density will have, uh, will be proportional to F, the original density. And also this is indicator function where Y of Y exceeding L. So it wants to, I mean, important sampling dens density indeed wants to focus on the region where important events will happen. That's why it is called important sampling. And, but here, if you look at the denominator, this denominator is exactly the quantity that we want to estimate. That's the failure probability that we want to estimate. In other words, although theoretically optimal important sampling density is known, we cannot implement, implement this. If we can, that means we already know how to, uh, we already know the true failure probability. And in the first place, we didn't need to use any estimator. So, Let's talk a bit more about optimal important sampling. So here, uh, instead of indicator function, this indicator function was used because this is deterministic simulation model where given x, y is deterministic. But if we consider stochastic simulation model where given x, y is random or stochastic, then we can replace that indicator function by uh, h of x that has uh, this uh, Theoretically, um, my, my research team uh, derived that, also with Yen Chi, we derived that this H of X for the uh, stochastic simulation model should be different from the deterministic simulation model. Um, and here, this function H of X determines the importance of each input X that we want to sample. And that's why, again, this is important sampling. And this important optimal important sampling density will depend on whether we are thinking of a deterministic simulation model or, or stochastic simulation model. And in practice, H of X will be always unknown because if it was known, then we didn't need to do any important sampling estimation. So H of X is unknown because this function for deterministic model or this probability of Y exceeding L given some input is unknown for stochastic simulation model. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hands um, and ask questions. All right, moving on. So to, because such optimal important sampling densities are unknown in practice, I mean, not unknown in practice, we need to approximate such optimal important sampling densities. And Typically in the literature, there are two main approaches to, approaches to approximate optimal important sampling density. First approach is building a meta model or emulator for H of X, which is unknown, but we could build such meta model given some data or given some evaluations of the simulation models. On Yen Chen I and also in my past work, uh, did such meta, meta model building to develop important sampling estimators. And typically, such uh, better modeling of H of X lead to better density approximation so that we can get better important sampling results, meaning that we can save computational time a lot by using important sampling compared with crude multi color simulation. But there's a drawback of building, uh, a drawback of this first approach. We need to build such meta model offline. So basically, this 
approach requires such offline modeling, limiting the applicability in practice, especially uh, some engineers who do not want to care about how to build such statistical meta model will not be really favorable about this first approach. There's a second approach that addresses that issue. This approach does not need any offline modeling. And in this case, basically we assume some parametric distribution family uh, for this Q star. And then we try to find some, uh, within that parametric distribution family, we try to find some density that is close to, or that mimics the optimal important sampling density. And this parametric distribution modeling approach has obviously some drawback because depending on your distribution family choice, your density approximation could be bad. So it is very important to choose the um, good distribution family for this parametric uh, modeling approach. So that was uh, generally about important sampling and, and how to approximate important sampling density. But this problem is actually even more ubiquitous in statistics. And that's why when we wrote this paper, we basically tried to market our uh, method or information criteria for more broader problem called Boltzmann approximation problem. And this term is coined by Yanchi. Thanks, Yanchi. So Boltzmann approximation problem is like this. It's a problem of approximating a density or target density when it can be evaluated up to a normalizing constant at a limited number of points. And this name of Boltzmann approximation uh, originated from statistical physics because this is Boltzmann distribution where phi represents energy state. And basically, based on some theories of physics, people, uh, physicists often want to come up with some Boltzmann distribution. And that Boltzmann distribution is only known to be proportional to this exponential function of uh, minus phi. So this is non-negative function, obviously. So we can regard that as some non-negative function R of x. And given R of x, given that we can evaluate R of x, essentially we want to estimate Q star. So that's the problem. That's BA or Boltzmann approximation problem. And here are some examples that you can often see in practice. First case where we can see BA problem is, as we already saw, approximating an optimal important sampling density. Second case is approximating, approximating a posterior density for Bayesian inference. So here, posterior density is Q star, and that's going to be proportional to, as you, many of you know, that's going to be proportional to prior density times likelihood of the model. So that's another setup on which, where we see Boltzmann approximation problem. Third example is approximating a counterfactual density for causal inference, which I'm sure Yen Chi can talk, Chi can talk more about when he has a chance later. And all, for all these examples in practical, in practical settings for Boltzmann approximation problem, evaluating R of x is computationally or sometimes uh, physically expensive. So that's the important practical constraint we need to consider when we try to address BA problem. So now coming back to important sampling again, basically we are going to essentially focus on, I mean, we are going to propose a method uh, to solve this approximation of BA problem using information criteria. And we are going to particularly consider estimating optimal important sampling density in this uh, particular paper. So to approximate Q star, there's one well-known method, one per, uh, well-known parametric method in the literature, which is known as cross-entropy method. Here in this cross-entropy method, which was developed in 1997 by Rubinstein, the, uh, we consider some candidate density Q of X that's parameterized by theta. And theta has the dimension of a D. And Q, this Q belongs to distribution family that you choose. And here, uh, by assuming, uh, after assuming distribution family, we want to measure close, closeness of Q to the optimal Q star using KL divergence, cubic liberal divergence, which is widely used in, in the literature, in statistical inference especially. 
And this is KU divergence uh, from Q to Q star. And you can expand this expression and you can see that it has two terms. And the second term is known as cross entropy, entropy from Q to Q star. And you can see that K divergence is going to be minimized if Q was equal to Q star. That's why we want to minimize this K divergence to find Q that's going to be very similar to Q star. But since the first term is only dependent on Q star, you can see that to find Q dependent on theta that is closest to Q star, you can simply focus on second term, cross entropy. So the goal of cross entropy method in practice is to find parameter theta hat that minimizes the cross, cross entropy because that's going to minimize KL divergence. Now, here to approximate the cross entropy in practice, obviously we are going to use the data. And here h of x is the quantity that's unknown, but that could be evaluated using data. And we can simply try to uh, approximate this cross entropy by using sample mean um, in place of H. Uh, and in, here we are using important sampling estimator. So that's why instead of F, we have a W. So we are using likelihood ratio here to estimate cross entropy. That way, uh, we can find theta hat. That's going to hopefully minimize the true cross entropy from Q to Q star. Here's graphical illustration of this idea. So again, we consider some um, distribution family that's parameterized by theta. And this big circle represents that distribution family. And within that set, uh, we have this candidate density Q, and we hope to update theta so that this density, important sampling density Q, is as close as possible to Q star, our optimal density. And that difference between um, the difference between Q and Q star will be measured by cross entropy or equivalently K divergence. And since cross entropy, true value of cross entropy would be unknown since Q star is unknown, we are going to use data to estimate that. And then we will try to minimize that estimated cross entropy in hopes to uh, minimize the difference between Q and Q star. We can iterate that process based on continually gathered data or continually gathered sample of evaluating our simulation model. So then we can continue to update our Q so that eventually uh, we hope that this Q is uh, going to be very, very close to Q star. And here, one assumption is the Q star obviously belongs to this distribution family so that uh, in theory, we can uh, make sure this our approximate density approaches the true uh, optimal density. But even if that's not the case in practice, that should be okay as long as that Q star is pretty close to the whole distribution family, as you can imagine. Another way to make sure this cross entropy me method works well is making sure this distribution boundary is really wide or, and broad enough to hopefully cover that Q star. So using very, very, fle very, very flexible uh, family of distribution is going to be helpful to approximate such uh, optimal and likely complex density. And there are various variations of cross entropy met method in the literature. And there are a group of methods that are purely parametric. And as you can imagine, computationally, those methods are very efficient but oftentimes they are not flexible enough, meaning that their distribution families do not necessarily include uh, optimal important sampling density or target density. To overcome such problem, non parametric methods could be uh, used, but it is well known that such methods tend to be computationally quite poor, and although flexibility of such non parametric distribution is excellent. So to come up with some approach that sits between parametric and non-parametric approach, one way to tackle this problem is uh, using some mixture of various parametric distributions, believing that such mixture will likely cover or, or be very close to the optimal or target density. So in this work, we were considering 
uh, various mixture densities and specifically Gaussian mixture model because of its flexibility. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Gaussian mixture model, and it is essentially a mixture of multiple Gaussian distributions. Here, important thing we uh, need to care about mixture density is K, which is the number of components that are included in that mixture density or mixture distribution. Depending on K, we basically, uh, K basically determines the flexibility of Q. So that's why it is very important to be careful about this choice of K. Let's say optimal density, optimal important sampling density looks like this on the left hand side. If we use two small K with Gaussian mixture model, for example, let's say only one Gaussian mixture, uh, Gaussian component, then that's going to be just a Gaussian distribution like this. That's not going to fully capture the optimal density. But if we, we use too large K compared with the sample size, then it's going to be essentially overfitting the data and it will be too wiggly compared with the target density, for example. So basically, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Yang, actually, I think there, there was a question about is cost entropy method different from the variational inference in, in, in any ways? Uh, Yes, they are different. That's a great question. Actually, I had some slides about variation inference method later in this slide deck, but I removed that um, in the last minute. So they are indeed different. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about cross entropy method, I do recommend you take a look at this 1999 uh, paper, and you can uh, clearly see that it is somewhat different from variation or inference method. But they have some similarity, especially based on the fact that uh, they do rely on, co on Quebec liberal divergence. But uh, yeah, I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but they are uh, somewhat different, yes. Thank you, Yanchi. But again, if anyone else has any questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, and since variation inference method is quite relevant to cross entropy method and similar setting, uh, since variation or inference method is also used widely for approximating posterior density for Bayesian inference, actually this paper has a lot of relevance to variation or inference. So I don't know who asked the question, but I'll be I'll love to talk to you more about um, the relevance later offline. All right, small versus large k. Uh, Again, uh, the, the judiciously choosing K is important to make sure such mixed density, mixture density is, can potentially cover the optimal density, or at least close to that. But in the literature, we couldn't find any paper that suggests rigorous way to choose K for cross entropy method or important sampling in general. So typically in the papers, they assume the K is either given or they were using some rule of thumb based on problem structure. But if you think about it, this is fairly typical model selection problem that you are already quite familiar with. So this model selection problem and essentially the K, the number of components determines the model complexity. And when we saw such, uh, to solve such model selection problems, oftentimes in practice, many practitioners indeed use AIC or PIC types of, types of information criteria or other various other approaches like cross-validation. And you already know that if, for example, again, considering Gaussian mixture model to estimate uh, distribution or population distribution from which you have data, then, uh, that number of components is indeed important in such models selection in statistical modeling. And if K is too large, like in this blue curve, uh, it's going to overfit the data and too wiggly compared with the true uh, density. And if we have a right a number of components in Gaussian mixture, even in statistical modeling, you will be able to uh, have really nice approximate density close to optimal density or target density. But that's a statistical modeling setup where you have data and where you try to estimate the population distribution based on the data, uh, based on that data. But our problem setting is different. It's not exactly statistical modeling. We want to find density that is close to target density in this BA problem, Boltzmann approximation problem. 
But we can draw some similarity between those model selection problem and BA problem. And specifically, we can extend AIC, AKK information criterion, criterion, which is widely used in practice. Although it might not be, uh, yeah, depending on who you are, you might not really like AIC. Depending on the problem settings, it might not be the best oftentimes. But still, AIC is known to be quite useful in practice. And it has two terms. First term is goodness of fit. Second term is complexity penalty. And this goodness of fit essentially measures whether approximate density is close to the population density. And complex penalty essentially penalize this low likelihood based on the dimension of the parameters being used for characterizing parametric density that approximates the true population density. Oh, and obviously this theta hat is MLE. And in our case, we are proposing this new information criterion uh, named cross entropy information criterion, CIC. This is quite similar to AIC. It has also two terms. First term measures closeness of our approximate, approximate density to the optimal density or target density in our BA problem. And this is going to be, this first term is going to be an estimate of cross entropy to a multiplicative constant. And second term is again complex penalty. It has same term within it, but it has additional term like this. Because left hand side is cross entropy, again, to a multiplicative constant, not the log likelihood, although they are fairly similar. It has additional term like this. Oh, and here D is the dimension of uh, S, F, dimension of the parameter that's going to uh, hopefully minimize the true cross entropy from Q to Q star. And because we, because we have this additional term in the second term of CIC, well, we, need, we can estimate that fairly easily using the data since uh, we have these evaluations from our simulation model. And Yang Chi and I drive some theoretical justifications of CIC, cross, uh, cross entropy information criterion, to make sure this is indeed theoretically valid. And essentially, we, uh, by the way, this is a simple version of what we presented in our paper. So you, you can check out the technical details. But for this presentation, I just wanted to simplify things so that it could hopefully be more clear to you. So we basically drive the asymptotic bias of uh, estimating this true, uh, true cross entropy based on this uh, estimator using the data-based estimator. And we drive that asymptotic bias will like this, will, will look like this. So that's why uh, in our CIC, we have this biased cross entropy estimator plus this bias correction corresponding to this term. Again, if you are interested in the technical details, please check out our preprint. All right, so the cross entropy uh, in our simulation modeling setup, uh, again, first term measures closeness of Q to Q star, second term, second term complexity penalty, and H of X will depend on whether we are considering stochastic simulation model or deterministic simulation model. And here's an interpretation of cross entropy information criterion. As the number of components k, or which would be proportional to model complexity or model dimension or model order, as that uh, model complexity increases, CIC will decrease first, indicating that Q of x, our approximate density, is getting closer to the Q star x, the optimal or target density in our uh, Boltzmann approximation problem. And then once we start overfitting the data with our mixture model, then CIC will start going up. So we can essentially find our best number of components that we want to use for our mixture model. That's the idea of CIC. We have three curves here, like a red solid line and so on. That is because of um, this graph is from our paper where we consider basically updating our mo mixture model as we collect more data. So as we increase the sample size, uh, this is different CIC we, com we computed across different number of components. And when we have largest data size, 
then we can see that corresponds to this green dashed line and that varies not much compared with the case where we have um, where we only use smaller number of sample size smaller sample size all right here's an overview with uh, overview of cross entropy method with with the cic information criterion again uh, in our simulation modeling setup x is originally from f but we want to use important sample want to use important sampling density and we want to run a simulation model based on those inputs sampled from that important sampling density but this important sampling density is now a parametric distribution or mixture distribution that is parameterized by theta. Uh, based on first iteration data, uh, we evaluate the simulation model and get outputs. And based on data, uh, we can minimize that estimated cross entropy using our CIC and update theta. And we repeat that procedure and gather more, gather more data so we can iteratively improve our mixture distribution model that approximates Q star. That's the idea. And here's an example. We're considering determinist computer model. And in this uh, structural safety example in this paper, the failure region is defined like this. And essentially that determines the optimal important sampling density like this. And using our model, basically uh, within one iteration, we have this yellow dots are all the data we gathered in this two dimensional space. And we use some EM algorithm like expectation maximizing, maximization algorithm like algorithm to minimize the cross as minimize the estimated cross entropy and refine our mixture density so that eventually our density like this is really close to the optimal important sampling density. So in this example, we are comparing our method where we use CIC with uh, this cross entropy method versus benchmark method from that paper that uh, implemented this particular example. And here we could uh, show that our method essentially achieves uh, even more computational savings with the, uh, than the, that benchmark method compared with cross, uh, compared with, sorry, crude Monte Carlo method. Another thing we could note it uh, we could note from this uh, simulation experiment was that our number of components determined from our CIC was always smaller than like 10, between 10 and 13, depending on different uh, threshold parameter L, compared with 30, which was fixed in that particular paper for that benchmark method. And that was one numerical experiment. And we also did some case study, and this is already published in different paper, not this paper. Uh, since it was engineering journal, we were able to publish this uh, results. And here we were using this simulation model uh, developed by National Renewable Energy Lab, which is one of the US Department of Energy Lab. And they were using high performance computing to evaluate wind turbine reliability and they were struggling with a lot of computational issues and we wanted to develop computationally way more efficient method than um, crude multi color method. So input X is wind speed and that could be sampled from this known distribution, truncated Raleigh distribution, according to international standard regarding reliability evaluation of wind turbine design. And output was, as I said before, uh, structural load response of wind turbine blade at its root part. So that was the up variable. And specifically, we are looking at two different up variables at the blade root. AGY's, uh, AGY directional uh, structural load response and flare directional load response. For those two different load, load response, we are comparing our method with the meta model based method. As I said, um, my previous work developed meta model based important sampling method. And I compared this CIC-based method with that previous method. Essentially, computational saving was comparable. And these computational savings are against crude multi color method. So in other words, here, uh, if to evaluate the reliability uh, considering AGY's structural response, we could save 95% of computational resources compared with crude multi color method. If, in other words, if crude Monte Carlo, crude Monte Carlo method took 100 hours, 
This method only took five hours to evaluate the reliability uh, regarding HY's structural response. And this comparable performance was quite encouraging because our method is essentially automated method. We do not need to off, uh, build meta model, model offline when we use CIC because once we use this mixture model and use CIC to automatically determine the number of components, everything is essentially automatic. So you can easily use this CIC-based impotence sampling method in practice, in engineering, um, by practitioners who do not need to worry about building statistical meta model. In summary, to summarize this talk, uh, in this paper, we essentially, essentially we propose an proposed an information criterion to choose the minimum cross entropy model for Boltzmann approximation problems. In other words, we came up with a way to approximate target density in BA problems. And also in collaboration with NGU, we characterize the information criterion's theoretical properties, including asymptotic unbiasedness of the CIC and its sufficient conditions. Uh, it was surprising that for AIC, there was no rigorous justification of AIC. So basically, our, um, especially Yanchi's contribution here was that this derivation of sufficient conditions for CIC indeed also applies to AIC, making sure everything is rigorous. So that was one theoretical contribution in this paper as well. Lastly, basically developing this CIC enabled the important sampling basically automatic. So we can use such automatic generic algorithm for important sampling in practice easily. That's it for my presentation. Thank you so much for your uh, attention today. Again, if you're interested in this work and technical details, please check out this preprint. And again, I really want to express my gratefulness to NSF for supporting this work. With that, I'm open to taking any questions or comments. Okay, thanks, Yang. And I think actually there was there is a, a question in the Q and A section. I don't know if we can read that or. Um, let me see. Now, yeah, now I can open the question. Yeah, I so. think I missed this. What is the downside of using AIC or BIC for this problem that the CIE CIC is trying to address? Uh, downside. Oh, here. Thank you, Jennifer, for asking this question. So there is basically we cannot use AIC or BIC to address BA problem, Boltzmann approximation problem. So uh, there, let me use whiteboard as I as if I'm teaching in class uh, and see whether I can actually write on my stuff uh, here. So the context of AIC is different, or problem of AIC is different from the problem that. Uh, requires CIC. So AIC here, uh, the goal of AIC is minimizing the low likelihood and the goal of uh, CIC is minimizing cross entropy. So AF for AIC, oh yeah, I can see, you cannot see the, so it, the set, setting or problem where you use AIC is that like you have the data that is from some unknown distribution. So th this data is from unknown distribution and your goal is to estimate this distribution using parametric model. The setting of a CIC is that uh, you can gather data, but the gate, your goal is not to estimate the distribution from which you gather this data. Your goal is to use this data to approximate the density, uh, approximate, the, approximate some target density. So here you have your data essentially represents evaluation of R of X that is proportional to Q star or optimal density or target density that you want to approximate. So you can evaluate R of X and that's going to represent your data, but that does not mean uh, you have data from your population distribution that you want to approximate. Okay, so that was the first question. Thank you again, Jennifer. Second question, can you extend your method to mixtures of non-Gaussian distribution sets as well? Yes, that would be fantastic. I didn't do it myself, but theoretically, yeah, we are considering any general parametric models, so that is absolutely possible, yes. And if you're interested in doing that, please let me know, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah, Jennifer, thank you. 
Okay, any other questions? Okay, so well, actually, I'm, I, I have a question. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask, although because I'm also like a, a collaborator in this project. So <laughs> but it's maybe just curious, you know, like I think it's for like representing a more like a broader interest of, you know, there's a, a lot of time when people are trying to deal with this function like approximation to optimal distribution. Sometimes people would try to use something like Gaussian process. So if somebody was curious about, well, can we use a Gaussian process in like this problem setup? Is it possible to do that or, 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 you know, because one simple way to think about it is that suppose I don't know the Q star, like I want to approximate a Q star, right? Maybe I can just evaluate a certain point and do a Gaussian process. And then that might tells me, well, what would be the next point I can evaluate? That's a kind of a, a, a traditional technique and procedure people are doing. So I'm just curious, like in, in, at least in these problems, and can, can we also do the same thing or it, they might encounter some difficulty on, on these directions? You know what? That's an exciting idea. Uh, I think that is possible. Um, and since the third author with this paper, Nick Carey, is in extensively working on Gaussian process uh, regression modeling, I think if we can work together on that problem, that would be very exciting. So yeah, I'm gonna yeah. Since it's such an exciting idea, I'm not gonna uh, try to use this time to discuss further that idea. Let's make it offline. Any other questions or comments? And by the way, um, I want to advertise my research lab, Disaster Data Science Lab. If you were excited by the idea of using statistical method for studying disasters and trying to help other people who are suffering from disasters, various disasters like COVID-19 or like hurricanes during this pandemic, please contact me. I would love to collaborate with many people so we can do develop various statistical methods and use statistical method to tackle important problems in the society. Yeah, okay. Actually, I saw that. Sure, then raise a hand. So I think sure, actually, you might be able to unmute yourself. Okay. Do you want to try that? Yeah. Okay. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, could you go back to the slide where you uh, where you have real data applications and you and you have like the the uh, runtime speed up. I, I guess I'm just wondering what it. Yeah. Um. So so is is the idea that you ran the model until the standard error of your uh, samples reached some fixed threshold and then saw how long that ran. Or did you tr do you have some sort of like accuracy uh, threshold that you tried to meet before you stopped running the the Monte Carlo? Uh, thank you for asking that, Sh Sheridan. Uh, yeah, I didn't explain uh, clearly about this case study. So here we essentially fix the number of replications, number of evaluations we do evaluate our simulation model. So that was sort of a stopping criterion we used, not the accuracy level. So here, specifically for flat-wise experiment, we use sample size of 2,000, and for the edge-wise, we use 1,000. Since each, again, each replication means one minute wall clock time of running the simulation model on our computer, even if we use, even though we use high performance computing. So 1,000 replications means yeah, 1,000 um, minutes. And we w repeated actually this experiment 50 times, so you can do the math and see that it, it, this kind of experiment takes several days to run. So we basically fixed uh, these replications because in, pra in practice, we have that computation, set computational budget, uh, and within that computational budget, we want to estimate, for example, failure probability to evaluate the reliability of the structure, like in this case, wind turbine. That's why we just set the sample size, not the accuracy level. Right, that makes sense. But then, what are you saving? Because if you if you have a fixed computational budget for using CMC versus your method, I mean, presumably the point is that your 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 estimate of that expectation is is much more accurate. But it's but you don't know for real data what the true expectation is, right? Uh, you're, you are right, absolutely right. So here, basically, um. So, okay, to compute this saving, this saving is against CMC crude multi color method, assuming that this estimator, the estimate is probably quite uh, accurate. Since this sample mean is based on average of 50 experiments, uh, we were quite sure that this is quite close to true value. And as you can, as you know, 
CMC is, is essentially based on binomial distribution. So we can use this estimator to estimate the standard error if we were to use CMC. And we compare this uh, observed standard error with CMC standard error, like the theoretical or estimated standard error to compute uh, computation saving. In other words, uh, to achieve this level of standard error, CMC will likely need to run sample size, will need to use sample size of say more than 10,000. Then yeah, that's basically regarded as computational saving of achieving similar level of, level of accuracy using smaller sample size. Okay, that makes sense. And then your and then your benchmark for the like the true the true expectation, you just use some like this meta model method and presumably just threw a, a ton of computational time behind it to make sure that it was accurate. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Very great. And other questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Cho, for a great talk. Uh, so one of the questions that I had was, uh, like, in the estimation of failure probabilities, and often in disaster management, we are interested in estimation of probability of extreme events. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like, rather than using mixture of Gaussians, like using mixture of uh, some other heavy tail distributions, like P distribution might help uh, in getting better accuracy of these kind of extreme events probability? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that that's the sort of I guess beauty of um flex beauty of flexibility of this kind of framework. Um, thanks to Yin Chi, we were able to generalize this CIC to parametric modeling setup where we can consider basically any mixture model of parametric distributions. So yes, for extreme events, I agree that considering mixture of heavy tail distribution would be very likely more useful than considering mixture of Gaussian model, uh, Gaussian components. I agree. Yeah, and just like a small follow-up question was, uh, so like you talked about uh, using information criteria based rule to choose K. And I think you mentioned a bit about like using non-parametric uh, distributions where like a uh, mixture of distributions. Uh, so like are there uh, like directions that you want to pursue in that way, like using non-parametric Bayesian techniques and so on to estimate the value of K? Oh, to estimate the value of K. Oh, I didn't think about that. But with Yenchi, again, uh, we wrote a paper where we consider non-parametric modeling approach for important sampling. And that work is available. I have that reference somewhere in the paper in case you are interested more in non-parametric approach. Please let me show you that paper really quickly, hopefully. Uh, Huh. Maybe I missed it. Oh, here we go. So this uh, second reference, basically in this paper, uh, Yen Chi derived beautiful properties of using non-parametric model for important sampling and its optimality. Uh, so it is pretty cool to take a look. Yeah. Uh, so I would recommend you to take have a look at this. But I really um. I'm quite intrigued by the idea of using non parametric modeling for estimating K, but I didn't carefully think about that. So maybe we can talk more about that offline. Yeah, so, so just one, two, one, one thing. I think I don't know if you are also you are thinking about a Bayesian non parametric methods rather rather than just mm -hmm. a regular non parametric, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. so, so that paper we are using the free, I would say frequency non parametric estimator. So we, we can even prove that well, there are some, some theory you can even prove that it's like asymptotically oracle estimated that kind of problem. But we haven't really touched the Bayesian non parametric because the Bayesian non parametric have all these Dirichlet process, that kind of things. But I think that's a very interesting and very exciting idea. I think it's possible to use the Bayesian non parametric method, but that's something that beyonds my, my, my skill. And, and, but you know, if you're interested in that, I think we will be, I will be, we, we will be more than happy to really discuss more details about like how to potentially use the Bayesian non parametric methods in this context or like do model selections. Thank you. Oh, now I better understand your question. Thank you, Yanchi. That, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. No problem. So, any other questions? Yeah, I see already it's time. So. Questions. Yeah, it's already 4 30. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Yang, and thanks everybody for participating. So, next we will have another speaker and very exciting work from Microsoft Research. So, stay tuned and have a nice weekend. Thank, Thank you, Yanchi. Thank you all. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.